please help me welcome Andrew Leland. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here and do this. I'm going to try something that I have never done before, which is to um, try out an episode of The Organist that I'm currently working on. Um, so the audio part of it is still kind of a mess, but um, and maybe the script is also. But it, um, it's not just like a random episode. It's, uh, it, it speaks to, it happens to sort of be in its own way of... Uh, in line with what, what you all are, are studying and talking about in terms of audio narrative and um, experimentation and story structure and stuff like that. So it starts out uh, this season on The Organist. I've been talking more personally about my own experience of vision loss. Um, so it starts there, but don't worry, it'll, it'll get to podcasting uh, uh, soon. So um, yeah, but, and also please forgive me if uh, I just have to like frantically paw through my Adobe Audition session here uh, in the middle. Uh, it'll be okay. Don't worry. I'm talking to myself right now. Um, uh, so I've been telling myself and everyone I know the same story for the last 20 years, and it goes something like this. When I was in high school, at some point I started noticing that I saw it differently than my friends. We'd be walking through the woods at night, engaged in our usual teenagerly pursuits, which is to say doing drugs, uh, but no one else seemed to have any trouble noticing the trees that I'd inevitably walk into. And it was weird how I would be the only one, the only person at the movies paralyzed with anxiety at the prospect of leaving my seat to go find the bathroom after the lights had gone down. After years of this, I finally convinced my mom that there was something wrong with my eyes. She booked me an appointment with Dr. Heckenlively, an ophthalmologist at UCLA. Heckenlively, who I gotta say was Heckenlively, uh, confirmed <laughs> what I'd already figured out using my dial-up internet connection. I had retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. Dr. Heckin Lively told me that RP is a degenerative retinal condition. He described the next few decades of my life in terms of a lopsided arc. The disease would progress slowly through my 20s and 30s, with my vision narrowing into an ever smaller tunnel, and then when I approached middle age, the degeneration would accelerate. The tunnel would close in faster and faster, and then eventually it would start to eat into my central vision. He said I could expect to be mostly blind by middle age. And <clears throat> this is the story I've been carrying around for the last 20 years. And Heckin Lively's prognosis has so far seemed to bear out. The doctor didn't draw a diagram. Hold on, I've got a piece of paper I need to not lose here. Uh, I'm just going to, oh, this is an old talk. Should I just give this talk instead? Uh, I don't know. What a disaster. Uh, here's the pa piece of paper I want. I'm going to leave it here. Um, he didn't draw a diagram, but if you graphed the vision loss he described over time, it would look like a gentle slope down that a gentle slope down that suddenly plummets off a cliff. So now I go back to see a retinal specialist about every two or three years, and the visits just confirm what I already know. I still have RP, and there's still no treatment for it, and my vision is still declining. All right, well, let's get you started so that you're not, you're not going to do the longest, most arduous test of the year. Geez. Great. Yeah, that one is like, yeah. like Dr. Frankenstein a little bit. So last month I went back to the eye infirmary for one of those bi-yearly checkups. I was expecting the visit to be the normal routine. <clears throat> Dilate my eyes, mostly failing the visual field test. This is where this is getting challenging. Uh, bear with me. Um, and, uh, you know, they told me to eat oily fish. I read the eye chart. But this time, near the beginning of my visit, I had a consultation with a doctor I'd never met before, a fellow who was spending a year at the hospital before starting his own practice. And he asked me how things were going, and I said the thing I've been saying for 20 years, the thing I just said to you, to my friends, my family. I described the decline like Heck and Lively had, a slow decline followed by the plummet off a cliff in middle age. And then this thing happened that has never happened before. Oh, easy. Easy does it. Um, what was that thing that never happened before, you ask? Uh, the doctor revised the diagram. He was like, well, vision is weird, Andrew. You might think you lost a lot of vision recently, which I never told him that I had, uh, but you, you probably didn't. And I was like, why are you doubting me? Uh, I know I lost vision recently. Isn't this how it's supposed to be? You know, I'm approaching middle age, the decline, the soft shoulder, the plummet. And then he said this thing that feels like it changed my life, uh, at least in the week or two since it happened. 
Um, this is what I said. It accelerate as it progresses? No. Oh, you has to be logarithmic oh. linear. I did not know that. At least when we measure the electrophysiologic signal. It's a, and I think everything. I mean, it's, it's thought to be a sort of more linear logarithmic. Oh, that is counter to what I understood. That's, that's, that's encouraging to hear. Yeah. Cool. A linear logarithmic decline. How do you like that? All right, round of applause. Uh, not the most evocative phrase, thank you. Uh, but as I listened to him say it, my brain was spinning like the machine centrifuging mouse DNA three fours below us. My graph of a shoulder was wrong. Now it's shaped more like something that's all logarithmically linear. A peaceful meadow, maybe, sloping downward with no cliff at the edge, or a well-made aircraft with an expert pilot making its final descent to the tarmac. I uh, might have central, decent central vision for five, 10, 20 more years. After that, I went through, after that conversation, I had more tests, and at the end of the day, I had my meeting with my usual doctor, who was this guy's supervisor, and she said I could record her, but she didn't want me to make the recordings public, so this is where I'm gonna need a volunteer from the audience. Can, would somebody be brave and just come up here for a second? Um, this is what this special piece of paper is. Yeah, come on up. I think everybody can hear us. Let's not worry about the microphone. Yeah, I've got a loud voice. Um, so, what's your name? Lauren. No, oh, read, no. read the script. <laughs> oh. <laughs> My name is Dr. Rachel Huttfeldt. I'm a doctor at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Great. Thank you so much for doing this, Rachel. Uh, so, can you explain this to me? What changed? I thought I was going to go blind really rapidly, and now you guys are telling me it's going to be super gradual for the next however many years? Well, one thing that changed is we found the gene mutation that causes your RP. You're in... Ashkenazi? Ashkenazi Yeah, I Jew. am an Ashkenazi Jew. You're a Jew. Uh, yeah. Well, this mutation is prevalent among Ashkenazi Jews. There's a multi-center paper in 2011 looking at patients with RP from this gene. Most of them had decent central vision in their 80s. That paper only looked at those 20 subjects, so take it with a grain of salt. But I will say, your vision is pretty stable. I don't want you to be alarmed that you're rushing down a hill in a roller coaster picking up steam. It was a good 20 years ago that Heckin' Lively told you that you're going to be blind in middle age. I say, don't worry about it for the next five or ten years. Yeah, there's potential for your central vision to change before then. I can't guarantee anything. But hopefully nothing is changing too dramatically any time in the next 20 years. Enjoy the vision you still have. Oh, thank you so much. Can we get a round of applause for Dr. Rachel, Rachel Huckfeld or Lauren? Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, bye. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was a mind ripper for me. That's, that's, that's definitely an information. Happy information. Uh, that night I got extremely drunk at the bar of the hotel I was staying in, and a good-natured businessman bought me a drink I definitely didn't need uh, to celebrate my good fortune. Vision for years longer than I had been planning. Uh, and the next morning, extremely hungover, I walked through Back Bay, which I hadn't explored at all in the last two days of going from hotel to hospital and then back to the hotel. I hadn't realized I was staying in such an iconically charming Boston neighborhood. Cobblestone streets, colonial townhouses, and the streets were silent. It was very early on Saturday morning. And as I was walking, I thought, what else have I been mistaken about? Maybe I don't even need this cane. And as I thought that, I, I crossed Beacon Street, and I was about to enter Boston Common, and my cane went off the edge of a small flight of stairs I'd been completely unaware was directly in front of me. If I hadn't had it, I would have tumbled down spectacularly. And so I had to remind myself, I'm still legally blind. The cane is still probably useful. But still, for the past two years, as I've been sure that my vision's plunge off that cliff was imminent, I almost never allowed myself to appreciate the visual world. I'd see something beautiful, like a park, resplendent in the late winter morning, and I'd think, what will this experience be like when I'm actually blind? What parts of this beauty can I make accessible for myself when I no longer have this little porthole of central vision that I've got? I've been seeing the world with a kind of paradoxical double vision. I'm seeing what I see now, and then simultaneously imagining what it'll be like when I'm blind. But that morning, a few weeks ago, with the park covered in blindingly white snow, and the low red brick walls lit up in the sun, and the sky cloudless and bird-filled, and everything ridiculously New Englandy and gorgeous, for the first time in years, I allowed myself to see it without that doomsday double vision. I just saw it, 
and I had an almost epiphanic feeling of joy in the directness of that looking. Uh, there's Buddhists. You guys know about Buddhists? Some Buddhists uh, who write and talk about the perils of narrative. Um, and I always think it's interesting when Buddhists talk about narrative, since it's usually you think of like literary critics. But um, you know, some Buddhist thinkers in Zen tradition talk about how everything we experience is just a story that we tell ourselves. That these stories that we experience as reality are just illusions, or more frequently, um, the Buddhist writers will call them delusions. Um, and if we could cut through the delusions, we'd see reality that lies underneath that has nothing to do with the stories that we tell ourselves. And I feel like I got a version of that lesson last week. I'd been told and I'd been telling myself and everybody the story of the sudden decline in vision for years. And now in an instant, in a few lines of spoken medical speech, I had this new story handed to me, the algorithmically linear graph. And almost immediately I started telling myself and everyone in my life, and now you guys, uh, this new story. And the, the lesson here is not that things are always as bad as they seem. And I feel like if I had a track of marimbas, this would be where I would bring up the gentle marimbas because I'm having a moment of reflection. Um, it's that that's not the lesson. The, the lesson is something closer to the idea that these stories we tell ourselves are, on the one hand, the best way we have of making sense of our lives, but they're also usually in some way inaccurate and flawed, and you could even call them fiction. And that's my idea of art also, um, a fictional map of a real territory, an idealized blueprint, a, a best laid flight plan that's crucial, but also always a failure in some way and fails to track with reality. And there, there's an overwhelming imperative, and now we get to podcasting, uh, especially in podcasting, to make sense of the world, to put our lives into a tight narrative arc a clear sequence of events that's followed by a powerful, relatable moment of reflection. And don't get me wrong, I live for that shit. Uh, even though I don't drive, because if I did, I would kill about six pedestrians a day, I still have driveway moments in my kitchen all the time where I'm like polishing a hole into my cutting board, listening to these shows with their strong narrative arcs, moving like roller coasters through a surprise twist down into their final emotional revolution, uh, resolutions. At their best, they're transcendent, and I do feel like I'm learning something about the world intellectually and emotionally, but when they're less successful, I feel manipulated, like I'm hearing the story of the precipitous decline when perhaps it's not like that at all. I don't mean that the stories aren't factually true, just that there's something about being that doesn't always feel like it exists on that kind of narrative line. And there are important parts of life that don't seem to intersect at any point with those big soaring arcs of narrative where you are bereft of marimbas. Um, sometimes we really do have giant reflective epiphanies in snow bright parks like I did the other week, but so much of life feels absolutely, I already wrote that, yeah, uh, absolutely absent of clear, clean narrative arcs. It, it feels messy, involuted, fragmented, and I want to hear stories like that also. And of course, there are writers who make work like that. Take for example, Maggie Nelson, she's written nonfiction books like The Argonauts that work in narrative. She's telling a story of her own family um, with, with, with events that happen and personal transformation, but she writes it in a way that feels as much like philosophy or poetry or criticism as it does memoir. And if you were to draw the graph of her books and the shape that they take and how they're structured, I think they have a much, much more complicated and elliptical and unconventional shape than a, sim than a simple arc. talk about art or writing or anything, there can be this almost unconscious idea that there's like an ideal art piece that if just somebody would make, the revolution would be actualized or art would be made whole again or you know painting would retake its place. I mean, it's like I don't really share in any of those fantasies because I see you know art really as expressions of individual 
the human beings and zeitgeist and you know a kind of form of metabolizing the experience of being alive and I would no more want to dictate what that was for anybody than I would like I don't care enough about art with the capital A to see it do anything. So that's Maggie Nelson. Um, a while ago she was sitting on a park bench in LA with a guy named Raynard Seifert and she talked to him about her work in terms that I think get at that sort of alternative to what can begin to feel like an inevitable narrative formula. And she says that her work is less interested in storytelling and more in per performing a mode of being that she finds most fruitful. She says art for her isn't about building an idealized structure, it's about trying to express something useful and something real about the way we think and feel and exist. But it isn't to say there's never any space for a horizon of how we think things might be better. It's just to figure out how to balance that desire for things to be better or different or transcended with the willingness to, you know, to, to contend with what is and not wish away its dirt or complexity or, you know, the contaminated status of being earthly beings. I mean, Sontag talked a lot about this, about how like, you're exercising the right to think out loud. I think it's that freedom to, to allow yourself to think out loud and to change your mind and, and take in new things, making more uh, pause in that, in that gray area, reckoning with things as they are, making a frame around something that, that, that already is, but providing a, a platform for it to be seen more clearly. And often I'll be like, oh yeah, you, I think you're totally right. And I'll say, well, that contradicts what you said here. And I'll be like, well, you know, today I've changed my mind, but it's because I'm not like making a scaffolding of a, of a, if you can't throw a rock here, throw a rock there. Well, you know, do you have to throw, you know, you have to throw the rock. Like, is there a third option we haven't yet considered? What if instead you just went out and said, who are you? Like, tell me about, you know, like, tell me about yourself. What about just asking about what it's like to be this person? You know, it's like, you know, what about, tell, tell me about your sexuality, tell me about your experience with drugs, tell me about your class status, tell me about, you know, just tell me something, you know, tell me something I don't know. Again, it's kind of like tweaking these models about tolerance to really wonder what kind of, um, what kind of attitudes towards other humans they actually um, indicate. And is it the one that's actually most compassionate and just, or is it one that is not? Sorry, this is what happens when you listen to the radio, my hour drive over here, so I'm full of bursting thoughts and feelings. I wonder why Sontag and Maggie Nelson describe thinking out loud as this right that has to be exercised. Is it, is it because there's some sort of tyranny in the opposite of thinking out loud? That, you know, putting things into the world that, that, that perform modes of being that I find most fruitful, you know. That there's a kind of mode of inquiry or honesty or um, uh, resistance to easy answers or ironies that, that, that feels meaningful to me to, to spend time with. Sorry about that. Uh, but so the question I was asking is, why does she describe the thinking out loud as a right? Um, that, that, that somehow there's something that pushes back against uh, this idea of thinking out loud, that you have to think in instead heavily crafted, edited, clean, straight arcs. And it makes me wonder, what would a podcast that pushes against that satisfying fiction of the narrative arc sound like? Would it be totally unlistenable? Or would it just sound like a conversation? Would it be somehow truer or realer than a story with a more conventional arc? Or is it just a different mode of being, a different flavor in the marketplace of commodified narrative audio? Hi, my name's Luke. I died in 2002. I was hit by a tram. I was only 31. I was survived by my wife, Alison. Hi. She's also my co-host. That's right. We're here to tell you about our brand new Marvel movie podcast. Simply Marvelous. Well, we chat all things Marvel, but from a dead perspective. Half alive and half That's dead. That's right, right, right. She's alive. I'm dead. I have no corporeal form, but we both love superhero movies <laughs> and each other. 
absolutely marvellous. I was buried a good six years before the release of Iron Man 1, so I've only ever known the Marvel Cinematic Universe from this side of the mortal veil. In future episodes, we'll be talking about some other things too. Yeah. yeah. About our lives, yeah, yeah, yeah. about the philosophical implications yeah, yeah, yeah. of living in this situation. Yeah, but there's so much that I think people would like to talk about, hear about. You know, not I mean, even though. No, no, I. 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 To share my theories with you on future films, trivia, plus some fanfic of my own. So check us out. New episodes every Tuesday to the end of time. To the end of time. Simply marvelous. Uh, <clears throat> so at the podcast I make, The Organist, we argue a lot about the tension between the need for clarity on the one hand and the right to think out loud or be self contradicting or opaque or ridiculous on the other. And I worry a lot about you, the listener. It's easy for you to get lost if I'm not super clear. And it's so much easier to get lost when you're listening to a story than it is when you're reading one. But I think if you're too clear, too logical, you can suck the life out of whatever you're making. But still, I feel an obligation as the host to guide you. I want this to make sense. I might offer you a little signpost in case you feel lost. Now that we've heard that piece, which was by Ross Sutherland, whose podcast is called Imaginary Advice, and it's one of the greatest, strangest podcasts ever made. I highly recommend it. Um, now we're going to listen to some similarly strange work um, by the artist Brian Balot. He's pranking his art dealer by leaving messages for him during an art fair. Balat's a trickster artist. His work is going to appear next month, I guess next month when this podcast comes out, so in two months, in the 2019 Whitney Biennial. Uh, in a recent gallery show, he exhibited frozen collages in freezers, calculators made of rocks, and a collection of old can openers meant to be performed like musical instruments by the viewers. His primary concern seems to be subverting the somber authority of the artist. Balat is also a performance artist, and much of his work uh, focuses on sound. He sings, dances, makes lewd grunts, and gives lectures in a string of jabbering nonsense. <laughs> He records himself making these sounds every day and has made hundreds of recordings, which he archives online. Annoying voice. Chee Chee. Hamster cage. Annoying voice. Chee Chee. Hamster cage. Balat is an old fashioned comedic ham. What about a poodle police system? Tons of poodles with cop hats on. His, his, his influences range from rap to classical, vaudeville to jazz to game shows. He's a staunch defender of the right to think out loud. All right, Mrs. Thompson, let me tell you what you want. Well, we have so many exciting gifts for you today. We have tenor on the island, and we have over. And let me tell you, when you slip into that grave, you do love it. <laughs> and let me tell you what we have for you, uh, Miss McGee. When we interviewed him for this podcast, he often responded with weird vocal sounds. He had a great time my bottle. Ah, well, uh, 
Oh, or he would answer in as the voice of one of his many characters. Collision, collision with the Russians. Or as uh, in song. Well, he found the wiggle, the wang, the whoop, the wiggle, the what, the wang. We found the what, the whoop, the one of the thing, things that I do is uh, something I call sound scribbles. Chee 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 bad crab laddie, he's a real crabby and he's crabby for lunch. Bad crab tabby, I tell you he's bad, but he's a bad lad crab tabby. Um, and that's just kind of a sonic notepad where um, I just go into things like noise, mumbling, nonsense, parody, um, caricatures. And so I've been doing this, I mean, really, ever since I got a tape player when I was a kid. But then I started to take it more seriously for the past 10 years or something like that. I'm a judge, bubba, bubba, judge, but I'm a judge, bubba, judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, I'm a judge, judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, and judge, bumble, judge, bumble, judge, judge, and judge, 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 That man needs to take some singing lessons. That's all I can, you know, maybe we can all pitch in. Um, maybe the, the listeners out there can put a couple of coins in the fish bowls and we can get this chap some singing lessons because, I mean, that sounded like a Stradivarius string popping, as far as I could tell. That's me doing a duet with the uh, radiator. You know, occasionally, um, I, I do them across from my apartment in an old studio which is really just another apartment. So a lot of times I do these sound scribbles pacing from one room to another or in the bathroom. So there's times where I've used the sink, times where I've used the toilet, sometimes where I've used the uh, shower, and in this instance, it's the radiator or radiator. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's rat, radiator that's across from the uh, shower. <laughs> So listening to all this high quality, all the high quality narrative audio that's churning through the marketplace today, it can seem like the only way to do things, or at least the only way to do them well. Last year, Rebecca Mead described the narrative structure of This American Life in a piece for The New Yorker, which I think of as the This American Life of magazines. Exposition, complication, epiphany, and resolution. Mead wrote that this structure, exposition, complication, epiphany, and resolution that has become so entrenched that it now seems inevitable. And again, I'm not criticizing this structure. I love it. Uh, I, I didn't start, and it didn't start, of course, with This American Life. Hollywood has been developing it for the past hundred years, and the theater and the novel for hundreds of years before that. But I have felt so deeply that inevitability that Rebecca Mead is pointing out here that I also feel compelled to push against it, or at least to question it. What are the other ways of telling stories? And what's the value in telling a story that's not easy to follow with stakes or a moral that aren't so clear? Work like Maggie Nelson described that's ambiguous or contradictory. And so I want to end today not with an answer to these questions, but with a last piece of writing that I think embodies them. It's by Renee Gladman. Gladman's a writer and an artist whose work is challenging and experimental and yet still deeply concerned with narrative. Glancing at a page of her writing, you can be fooled into thinking you're looking at a page of a conventional novel. People have names, things happen. But if you read more closely, following her prose, sentence by sentence, you'll be pulled along the contours of shapes that I've never seen in a story before. Sorry. Can I say my name? No, I have. I am Renee Gladwin, and this is Untitled Environments. Um. 
When I first read this piece, I thought back to Maggie Nelson's idea of writing as performing different modes of being. Gladman talks about narrative in similar terms. Narrative for her isn't some event happening in fiction. She sees it as a mode of being. For her, narrative is an energy, a light. So I want to end here with this strange piece of writing because it makes an oblique but I think compelling argument for how we might redefine narrative. Away from the didactic or merely descriptive, away from the prescriptions of ophthalmologists who in telling me how I would see the world in the future change the way I saw it in the present. I want to end today with the idea of narrative as a way of being, a way of just being in the world. For Gladman, narrative isn't a straight arc connecting A to B. It's a nest of intersecting lines, a space, an environment. And I love how this piece demonstrates what a narrative of being, what a philosopher might call an ontological narrative, might look or sound like. And there are no signposts here, listeners, so good luck. Here's Renee Gladman. I began the day wanting to bring into convergence three activities of being, what I'd seen, what I'd read, and what I'd drawn. And to say about these acts how they made lines in the world that ran alongside other lines, and how all these lines together made environments of the earth where I could put my body and you could put yours. And these would be lines always entwined because there was little, if anything, you could say or make without calling forth other lines. And this was how you knew you were where you were and the ground was worth cultivating and that there was life beneath the ground. I spent a long time looking into each of the acts of how I'd been in the world, how I'd conveyed that I'd been there, and I found all these overlapping currents and found that each of the acts divided into further acts, like the acts of writing and making narrative, which divided into acts of building and afforestation, which then led to sex and led to reading and wandering. I had found in drawing a way to think about narrative such that I could look into narrative without writing narrative and could see something about what it did. And I didn't have to place periods anywhere, didn't have to give details or unfold events, but could be in a narrative space, a space being built by narrative. And I could say this was happening because I was moving my hand across a page and I had a pen in my hand. I had a pen in my hand and for a long time or a short time I'd move it across a page and think or not think about narrative, what it meant to be a narrative, to feel narrative gather in my body and feel it work to move out of my body. But I'd be making a drawing and yet as I drew, I was often conscious of the resemblance of the lines of that drawing to those I made when I was writing. The resemblance was the sun at the bottom of the drawing page I was trying to invert a city to suggest a dense landscape. And the presence of this sun kept me cognizant that all the time I was drawing, I was doing a kind of writing that in its duration was drawing, in its shape was writing, and narrative pulsed at the core of all of this. The ink was the core of narrative. My hand was the core. The shape my hand made was the core. And I knew when I was saying narrative that I wasn't limiting it to some event happening inside fiction, but rather was trying to get at an energy, a light that threaded all my acts of reading and writing and drawing and seeing into a day then days. So the piece goes on past that, but I think we're about at time. Um, so with that, thanks, thanks you guys so much. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Um, it is wildly variable. Um, we've, we've, we come out every two weeks these days, and we have a ton of stuff in the pipeline, uh, sort of like in various stages of completion. I think of it as like a failing restaurant's walk-in mm -hmm. restaurant, you know, a restaurant uh, walk-in cooler, you know, the walk-in fridge where there's like some fresh produce over here and then like some disgusting old celery from a year and a half ago, and like, the time comes when it's time to put an episode out and I like rush frantically into that cooler and I'm like, all right, this and this and all right, let's go. Um, I so break Gordon like, Ramsay doesn't see it, right? What's that? Yeah, exactly. That, that, that the listener won't see it, you said? What, what's it? Break Gordon Ramsay won't see it. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's like a hell's kitchen kind of situation. Um, um, you know, so in individual segments can take months and months and 
it, it's hard to answer your question too because we just we're, we're so slow because it's nobody's full time job um, to do the podcast. We all are doing lots of other work, so things um, come together very slowly. Adam is here and he is long suffering. He's had a piece like how long has it been, Adam, that you've had your, your piece? You want me to say? It? Yeah, I do. It's been, um, it was not last summer, but the summer before last we commenced. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's been getting better. It's seasoning. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, fermenting in a good way. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. a like a porchetta side that's just slow. Precisely. <laughs> slow marinating or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. So some and then it, it's it's weird because there's as a listener you just experience it as the food on your plate. But you know there there might be some things that took three years and another thing that we like slammed together in three days uh, and they all just sort of run together. It also really depends on the format. You know like. To just to, to interview somebody, cut the tape, write a script into it. You know, you can do. You know, NPR reporters do that in three hours every day. Um, but then narrative stuff, where you're telling a story, you're reporting, you're interviewing multiple people, you're getting field sound, you're scoring it. That's a process that takes at least months. Uh, so you say we're saying we find that you have a whole group of people sort of working on these, uh, yeah. on these, uh, you know, pictures. so I was curious how many people at a given time you had working on the thing, what's that collaboration process kind of like? Do you have certain people focusing on individual aspects of that episode? Or? Yeah, this is something I've been trying to get better at, um, and I've been trying to steal from other shows, like as I sort of meet producers at other shows, I like to ask them how they do it, because we just kind of made it up as we went along, and it's not the most efficient way. Um, you know, uh, as the host, I tend to, you know, obviously I read the, the final script, and I'm also sort of like editor in chief. You know, like host is kind of a, it's di host is different at different places, just like a managing editor is different at different magazines. My background is in magazines, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So like my role is, I feel like, kind of editor in chief. So I'll like. Yeah, up, thumbs up, thumbs down things, I'll read that and I'll put a lot of attention into that final script. But then the different component parts will farm out a lot. So, you know, there's a producer that we have who works at Politico for her day job producing their podcasts, but she just is like a secret sound nerd that she doesn't get to sort of flex those muscles so, as much at Politico uh, for maybe obvious reasons. Um, and so she gets really excited about like spending her weekend sound designing the hell out of the piece. You know, so it'll just be the kind of thing where we're like, okay, Jenny's gonna do this piece, all the sound design. You know, there's, yeah, so it's kind of just like a division of labor and there's not a science to it. I just had a pitch accepted at a, at a show and I was sort of like, how is it gonna go with this process? And like what they were telling me, I was like, oh, that's how we should be doing it. We're basically like, I'm gonna send my script back and forth to her and then once we're at a place that we're happy with, then she brings it to like their whole group and then they all listen to it, and then I think after an edit there, then I'm gonna do like a read of it, where basically like I have all the tape and I have my script and kind of do hopefully a smoother version than I did today. Uh, you know, where I like read my lines, I play the tape, and then that'll be like another edit, and then at that point I think it'll be more or less locked, and then they start doing all the fine tuning. Like they have a composer on staff who will like compose music for them. So, yeah. Um, you said that part that the issue is that they wrote for Mick Sweeney's? Yeah. Which is the, I know the humor magazine, it's really funny. Yeah. Um, do you also, like, is the organist more of like a, not less humor, but more, like, it's two different types of art, and sure. like, do you, have you found that you prefer one over the other, or do you like to like mix both, or? That's a great question. Um, Mick Sweeney's is really interesting because it is a lot of different things. And, it's, and, and people you know, out in the world, when I meet people who've heard of McSweeney's, there's a lot of things that they could have heard about it for. Like one of them is the Daily Humor website that has like viral-ish uh, humor pieces about funny things. And it's like literary, but it's also like, you know, the, the final product is laughter. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the literary quarterly that publishes that's very interested in, like it's totally redesigned every issue. So some issues just look like a hardcover book. Some issues are, like there was a recent issue that was balloons that had stories printed on them that you could only read when you inflated the balloons. Um, and that publishes a lot of, you know, fancy pants writers and also young and emerging writers. And McSweeney's also does like a lot of kind of 
oral history work and social justice stuff. And um, so it's like a giant, it's a mix of pop culture and, and highbrow culture. And so I feel like the organist reflects that too. Like we've got, you know, this episode is a little maybe on the hoity or toity or end, but you know, Ryan Balot, like that's sort of ridiculous and funny. Yeah. But then you've got like Renee Gladman, which is like, you know, capital H, highbrow sort of. Yeah. Um, so I think we try to, to 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 make a mix like that. Like I never want to be too far in, either, in any one direction. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so, so we just heard what's basically a piece yeah. that you'll feature on the program. Have you done much of like presenting this sort of stuff live, or is this an experiment for you? This is an experiment for me, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I did the piece that you said you listened to, the, the Secret Life of Plants. I did a live version of that, but I had my friend hitting the space bar for me, okay. uh, which made it a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, and I need to learn Ableton Live, not to, not a production talk is interesting maybe, like I was just using the, the, the DAW, the, you know, the the Adobe Audition, the thing I used to put together the final episodes, which is not the best thing for live stuff because it's, it's sort of a clunky interface for playing, re queuing up. Ableton Live, like DJs use, or kind of like, you know, if like a band is trying to do like a live remix with like, like they'll have guitars, but then also you can like trigger different sounds. And if I'm going to do this again, I really wanted to take the time to learn that because that could really seamlessly be like, okay, I'm going to play like the Boston Common Birds Ambi track and then like, you up exactly when, you know, it's like, it's just, it's geared towards live performance. Right. Do you know that Roman Mars uh, presentation you did about flag design? No. Design of flags of the world? No. He must be using something like that. This is basically like a radio broadcast with all sorts of different sound and music and clips and all that. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah. yeah, it's an interesting form to think about. Do yeah. you know people who are kind of doing live sort of presentations with this kind of audio? The best version of that that I've seen is this group called Pop-Up Magazine um, that has a bunch of, like the people who run it, I think do a lot of This American Life and Radio Lab, and they're really seasoned audio producers. But the deal with it is that like there's never any afterlife to it. Like, they don't print a magazine, they don't release it as a podcast, it's just about the show that you go to. And they sell out huge theaters across the country, and they edit it as though it's an episode of This American Life. Like it's super tight and entertaining and interesting. And they'll have some pieces where it's more like the moth or something where it's somebody on stage telling a story, but then they'll do really interesting stuff with video and sound that weaves together like that. And that they, they, they did an amazing job of that. I would, and they do tours all the time. You could look them up and you know they'll be coming to probably New Haven or Boston or something. So Pop-up magazine. Pop -up. You know, like a lot of these guys like Roman Mars or Ira Glass, I know that they have like iPad trigger, sound trigger stuff, and it, it is right. like, like just like bands making money off the live tour. You know, I feel like podcasts, the, the podcast events are a growing right. source of income for these shows. Yeah. 